Excellent, yeah, I thanks. Can see okay, so my name is Pete Hutt Welker. I'm with Neil Systems, formerly ES2. Uh, now ES2 is part of Neil Systems. I'm a technical director here, and we're doing this virtual training uh, because we can't do it live. Uh, we actually have a training center at our facility down in Newtown. It's uh, called our Impact Center, Instrumentation, Measurement, Process, Automation, Control, Training. There you have it, all in one impact. And once uh, the COVID thing is down behind us, we will be getting together and we'll make sure you have invitations to training that we do there. So today we're gonna to talk about flow metering. And, uh, the training objectives are we're going to do a brief history of flow measurements, types of flow meters and different technologies, pros and cons of the different technologies, some final thoughts, and then we'll have a question and answer period at the end. Should wrap up by three o'clock and then we'll have question and answer. So here we go. Uh, a little history of flow metering uh, in China, 256 BC, somebody was looking at a dam that they built, I guess, and said, hey, look, the level's going up as the flow increases. How about that? That's, we're measuring the flow by how high the level is over the top of the dam. Uh, 1738, the Swiss used a differential type of uh, flow measurement. Uh, we'll talk about differential pressure. In 1791, the Italians used a Venturi tube. In 1922, the Parshall flume was invented by Bob, Bob Parshall, that was his name, and uh, he invented the Parshall flume. We'll talk about that. Uh, 1930, ultrasonic flow measurement. And 1950, electromagnetic flow measurement. There are a lot of different types of ways to measure flow and obviously we can't talk about them all today. So I'm focusing mostly on what you might see in a waste water or water treatment facility. So first thing I'm gonna talk about is open channel flow. Then we're gonna talk about flume, turbines, turbine flow, meter, venturi, electromagnetic, ultrasonic, and then area velocity. These are the different technologies we'll be talking about. So we'll start with weir level. And so here's a weir and you got your water flowing over the weir. And as the water flow increases, the level over the top of the weir increases. So you could just measure that with a ruler or you could put in a system which came a little later. Hey, I got an idea, let's put a float in there and hook it to a pulley and let's see that level change on a dial so we can tell what the flow is by the dial. Pretty simple. Then somebody said, hey, how about this? Why don't we try ultrasonic level measurement? And uh, so now today we measure this with ultrasonic and we'll talk about that in a little bit later. The accuracy of a flume or, or of a, a weir, I'm sorry, would be anywhere from two to 10%. They're not super accurate. The pros, uh, local, low total cost of ownership. Once you get this installed, it doesn't cost much to maintain it. Uh, good for high flows. It's got a good turn down, so you can get measurements that are very low flow as well. So some of the cons are that the accuracy is not very good. They're expensive to install. Obviously, sometimes you have to use concrete. You got to uh, do a lot of mechanical construction to put in a, a weir. And it's really for open channel only. You can't do it in a pressurized system. Uh, one of the other cons is you can get solids building up behind the weir, and that would have to be flushed out on occasion. So let's go on to flume measurement. So very similar to weir measurement, but in a flume, you're pushing the water through a throat. You're narrowing it down and then it discharges. And you can see here of an elevation view how the water drops off and then leaves the flume. 
Uh, this was developed by a guy named Bob Robert Parshall, and it's very common in water uh, in wastewater primarily. But here's the different types of flumes there are. There's a Parshall flume, the one you see here on the left. There's a Palmer Bolus flume, Mr. Palmer and Mr. Bolus, obviously. H flume. H flume is interesting. It's I'm going to show you a photograph of one, but I wondered what the H was for, and with the power of the internet, I was able to determine that the H, H flume, a lot of these flumes were developed by the agricultural uh, government, uh, Department of Agriculture for irrigation. And this was just letter number H of a whole bunch that they tested out, the H flume. Uh, trapezoidal flume, cutthroat flume, Montana flume, all different flumes for different applications. In wastewater, you mostly see the partial and the Palmer bolus. Accuracy of this, again, is anywhere from 2 to 10 percent. And if you've ever seen flow through one of these, it's turbulent. And it can't, it's hard to get real accurate when you have a lot of turbulence, especially on the top, to measure that level. Some of the pros, it's again, low total cost of ownership. Good at high flows. It flushes real well. So if you get flow through here, it's not going to build up solids. You can get a little bit of solid built up right at the front of the throat, but uh, nothing like a weir. Some of the cons, it's low accuracy, expensive to install, and gravity flow only. So here's a picture of a weir. This happens to be, be a V-notch weir. So if you make a weir in a V-shape, you can get very high accuracy at very low flows because you don't have this long uh, crest. You've got a very small crest, this V-shape. Sorry, let me back up. So you get more accuracy with one of these. You are limited to uh, volume though. You get a lot more volume across a straight edge weir. Here's a partial flume. Water flows in this end, goes through the throat. Nope, I'm click happy today. And uh, goes through the throat and out the discharge. In this case, you can see an ultrasonic transducer that's measuring the level of upstream of the float. And this one happens to have a stilling well off to the side. If you look down in this, you'd see a hole that goes through this over into that stilling well. And you actually could put the level transducer over here and it would still measure the head level relative to this area. So it's not too uncommon to see a stilling well. This is the H flume. And uh, this one we installed up at Topton on their water supply. So this is a clear well where they collect their raw water and this pipe used to just come into the clear well and they wanted to measure flow coming in. So we bolted this H flume to the end of the pipe. You can see it's a flange mount. Here's your ultrasonic transmitter. We put a couple of baffles in here to smooth the flow out a bit because you want smooth uh, plug flow condition coming into the, the discharge. Uh, unique about the H flumes is they discharge the atmosphere. They just they discharge they don't discharge into the water. You have to have an open discharge on these. So here's the way we measure the flow. Uh, basically, you put an ultrasonic transducer on top, just behind the weir or at the throat of the upstream of the throat on a flume. This is an example of an ultrasonic level transmitter. Uh, it sends sound waves down and they bounce off the top of the water and it can tell you the level of the of the uh, water. And then inside the transmitter, you can program it in for whatever type of weir you have. If it's a Palmer bolus, if it's a um, uh, partial or the type of weir you have. Is it a V weir? Is it a 45 degree V, a 90 degree V or is it a straight crested weir? All that information goes into here, and that converts the level over to an actual reading of uh, 
volume in uh, gallons per minute or MGD or whatever you want. Uh, some of the newer technologies is radar. This is, uh, we're promoting this a little bit. It's a little more accurate. It's, uh, it gets through foam and turbulence better. It handles temperature changes better than ultrasonic. So you can use radar for measuring level also. And then of course you could use a submersible level transmitter. You could just basically submerge this down in this tank and it measures the pressure, the head pressure in the tank or in the flume. Usually not used very often for this application, but it could be done. Any, if there's any way to measure level, you could probably use it on a flume or on a, a, a weir. Here's an example of an open channel meter. This is, I think, at Hatfield Wastewater Plant, and we're measuring the flow, and this is a 36 inch partial flume, and they're probably up around 15 or 20 MGD. And here's an example as, as well of the transducer over, the, over a weir. So that's open channel flow. Meter basically is a mechanical meter. The water comes in and spins a turbine on the tip of each blade. Uh, the tip of each blade as it passes across a magnetic pickup, it senses a pulse. That pulse comes, goes out and gets converted into a flow rate through the unit. The interesting thing to note is most of these flow meters from here on are measuring velocity. Uh, they're really not measuring the flow, they're measuring the velocity of the liquid going past the meter, which can then be converted into a volumetric flow by knowing the diameter of the pipe. The, the bigger the pipe, the more volume will go through it. So just remember that they're all velocity meters converting over to a volume reading. These are more accurate, 0.5 to 1%, used a lot more in water treatment. Uh, they have low costs of ownership, accuracy at very low flow rates, high resolution metering, good turn down. That means you can turn them way down to very low flows. Some of the cons are that there's a lot of moving parts to it. Uh, sensitivity to flow turbulence. If there's a lot of turbulence upstream, they may not read as well. And they're not compatible with water containing a lot of solids or particulates. Here's some examples. Uh, we've seen these, this is a residential meter. If you wanna get real low flows, they make compound meters. There's two different sections in here. One reads high flows, one reads low flows. So you can get a little bit more accuracy at the very low flows. Uh, all of these meters have registers that are mounted on top, and that converts the pulses over to an actual reading. And you can get those registers with a built-in transmitter so that you can transmit pulses or you can transmit a four to 20 milliamp signal back to your uh, SCADA. These are used a lot in water treatment. And these actually come with, um, I don't know if it's Wi-Fi, it's radio communication. So when they bill customers, they just drive down the street and it collects the data without having to go in to your house and read the meter like in the old days. So let's talk about differential pressure. So this is a Venturi tube. Uh, basically what you're doing is you're taking the water and you're, you're necking it down through a Venturi and causing a little bit of pressure drop across that. And by putting a differential pressure meter across that pressure drop, you can calculate how much flow there is. If you increase the pressure and increase the flow coming into here, obviously the pressure is gonna increase here. The more water you try to jam through that orifice, the higher the pressure is gonna get on the upstream side of this Venturi tube. And you read that differential pressure and you can convert it over to flow rate. There's a couple different DP cells you can use. This is called a V-cone. Uh, here's a flow nozzle. 
an orifice plate. And uh, this is interesting. I haven't seen this before. It's a segmented wedge, probably not that common. Mostly what you see in water treatment are these venturi tubes. Accuracy 0.5 to 1% at max flow. The lower the flow is, the less accurate it becomes. Low total cost on large pipes. So this is a good solution to a very large pipe. If you, uh, a lot of other meters would cost more. Very reliable, no moving parts. I've got customers that have these in for since the 20s uh, up in Scranton. There are some of these that have been working since the 20s. It's quite amazing. They're easy to calibrate because you're really just calibrating DP transmitter. Some of the cons, there's a big pressure drop. Uh, sometimes you can tolerate that, but especially with like an orifice plate, it's a blockage. So you're, you're, you gotta calculate out that head loss when you're designing the system. Uh, the sensing tubes can become fouled. There are tubes that come in here to get the pressures and they can get fouled sometimes. You have to blow them out or flush them out and uh, you can get air in the sensing lines. I will talk about that. Here's an example of a differential pressure transmitter. Here's this, the downstream side of the orifice. I'm sorry, this is the upstream side. The downstream is down here. These two pipes, this pipe and this pipe, come down to a manifold and feed the differential pressure transmitter. This is a big one. This one's from Lake Scranton. It's got, uh, I think this is probably a 30 inch pipe. And you can see they put 41 MGD through that particular flow meter. And so on the wall is your differential pressure transmitter that is, uh, looks something like this. And it measures the differential pressure across that unit, that Venturi and converts it over to a flow rate. On to magnetic flow meters. Uh, this is an, a diagram of an electromagnetic flow meter. And uh, you have to understand a little bit about electricity in that when you have a wire and you run a magnet across that wire, you can actually create a little bit of voltage or a little bit of current flow on that wire. That's how motors work and how generators work. Now water is a conductor. So this mag meter, there's a coil all around the pipe and that coil generates a magnetic field. As the water cuts through that magnetic field, just like if it was a wire cutting through the magnetic field, it induces a little bit of voltage on that water. And there's two little probes that, con that connect in there and they sense that voltage and send it up to the transmitter. And um, as the water increases in velocity through that, it increases the signal. And that is converted into a flow reading. Uh, here's an example of a mag meter. And the nice thing about it is there's no uh, obstruction to flow. It's wide open. There's just two little nubs in there that measure the voltage. Accuracy of these is anywhere from 0.2 to 5 per, uh, 0.5%. Uh, it's non-intrusive flow, so there's nothing to block, create any head loss, low maintenance, no pressure drop. Cons, high initial cost but it, it's usually offset by long-term savings. These are very reliable and uh, very, very good for uh, all types of fluids that are conductive. You couldn't use this for ultra pure water because it has to have uh, electrical conductance in order to work. Here's an example of a large mag meter, 24 inch. Here's a smaller one. This one we installed up in New Jer Alpha, New Jersey. It's uh, an eight inch on a water line. In this case, we cut the pipe and we used a, a compression type flange 
in order to uh, install this. It's quite easy to install. Here's a mag meter also. This is what's called a wafer style, and it sandwiches in between two flanges. So you save space and it's less costly. If we go back up to this one, you see how there's a flange on each side. The wafer style just sandwiches in between a couple of flanges. It also makes it easy to remove to service. You can pull out a few of these bolts and slip it out and do the service on it. Occasionally, those little electrodes on a mag meter need to be cleaned, and that's the service you would do. Transit time. So ultrasonic transit time includes two transducers that send out sound waves that bounce off the other side of the pipe and come back, and they're going back and forth. As the water flows through those sound waves, it distorts them, it bends them, and the time it takes for the sound to get from here to here and there and back increases as the velocity increases. So as the velocity increases through the pipe, there's a shift in time, the transit time, the time for the sound waves to get from here and back. And that's a transit time flow meter. And they mount on the pipe. And in this case, uh, they're mounted on a pipe with a couple of bands. There's a lot of ways to mount them. And uh, it's, it works well. It's non-intrusive. It doesn't block flow at all. Uh, you got to be a little bit careful. We recommend doing a, a test before we would sell you one, only to be sure that there's nothing that's going to interfere. If there's organic solids on the inside of the pipe, it could absorb the sound waves and you could get a bad signal. Uh, the other thing is that you, uh, if it's really thick, like I wouldn't use this on sludge because the sound waves are absorbed by that. Accuracy is about 1% of full scale. It eliminates the pipe penetration, no moving parts, requires proper installation on clean pipe surfaces. You have to grind it down and make sure that it's a very clean surface. And occasionally you have to recouple these because they start to lose their signal. Especially if there's a lot of condensation on the pipe, uh, that condensation can slowly interfere with the transmission of the sound waves underneath the sensors. So you have to pull them off and recouple them Mostly used on clean water. I, again, I wouldn't recommend it for sludge. The other type of ultrasonic is a Doppler meter. Doppler is used to, to detect particles in the water. Just like Doppler on the weather channel, you see the clouds in the sky. That is a Doppler transmitter reflecting off water particles that are um, in the atmosphere. And those uh, water particles can be detected. They can see how fast they're moving. They can detect what kind of particles they are, snow or water. So what this does is it sends this ultrasonic sound down. It reflects off bubbles and particles that are in the water. And it measures the speed of those particles moving through the pipe. It's very good for water that's got solids in it. It doesn't work at all for ultra pure water and sometimes on potable water. You just don't have enough air bubbles or particles in there to really reflect off of properly. So this is the type of uh, flow meter that we use for sludge and for raw water flow, raw wastewater. Accuracy about 2% of the reading. Uh, you only need one sensor, which is a plus. And, and like the other uh, the transit time, it eliminates pipe penetration no moving parts, excellent for particulates like sludge. Cons requires proper installation on clean pipe surfaces. It requires air bubbles. Again, with this particular unit, I would also recommend doing a test just to be sure that it's gonna work. And I say that from experience. <laughs> We've put a few in that didn't work. And it's usually a case there was, there was some type of organic buildup inside the pipe or there wasn't enough particles, or there were too many particles. There's a lot of variables there. The other type of flow meter is what's called an area velocity meter. And uh, that area velocity meter does two things. It measures the velocity of the water 
coming by and it measures the, the height. And you can put this inside a pipe and uh, you can get flows on a pipe that's not full. Uh, mag meters need a full pipe. Uh, ultrasonic meters need a, new, a full pipe. This area velocity meter does not. And so it eliminates a pipe penetration. It's easy to install, no moving parts, and no full pipe required. Uh, its downside is it has a minimum height of flow because of the height of the sensor on the bottom of the pipe. Um, and that sensor can pick up debris sometimes, and so you need to clean it occasionally. So here's a picture of one inside a pipe. This is at Kutztown and their effluent. We basically put this expansion uh, ring in to hold it. That slides in and then it compresses out on the pipe. And right in the bottom, you can see the sensor. And that sensor is going to sense the height of the water and the velocity. If you know the velocity and you know the height and you know the diameter of the pipe, you can do the math and determine the volume of water that's flowing out. This was a temporary installation, so we, we just uh, put some Unistrut in, mounted the transmitter, and this wire goes down into the, the manhole to measure flow. It's great for manholes and places where you've got an open pipe where you can insert this. Manufacturers uh, that have ones that have a level sensor on top, two different wires, one that measures the, the level and another underwater that measures the velocity. So that's all the flow meters I have. Uh, and here's some of my final thoughts before we get into some questions. Uh, there's a, so many different combinations of technologies to consider. I've only nailed about it's eight of them or so. There's literally hundreds of different ways to measure flow. You wanna give careful consideration to your particular application, sludge, solids, um, you know, flow, uh, pipe size, there's a pipe type of pipe, is it concrete lined? Uh, there's a lot of different considerations. Location, location, location. Where is the best point to install it? The rule of thumb is to have 10 pipe diameters upstream and five pipe diameters downstream. You want to have a nice straight run of pipe uh, to install this in to get your best results. That's not always possible and there's ways around it and it's not always absolutely necessary. So you, you wanna to talk to somebody that can help you with that. Consider your accuracy needs. How accurate does it need to be? Are you gonna be logging it or are you gonna be using it for control? Consider your capital and operating costs. Consider a pilot trial and uh, to determine the efficacy of the flow meter. Is it gonna work for you? And uh, some of them are cut and dry. A mag meter on potable water, I probably wouldn't have to do a pilot study. It'd be hard to do anyway. Uh, but ultrasonic, I'm always a little bit leery without doing a pilot study. And obviously ask your supplier for assistance and uh, we're certainly here to help you as well. So that's all I have. Uh, it is oh, a minute early. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, Rachel's here to help me. Uh, just uh, fire away. I'm going to take this screen off. Stop sharing. Yeah, you can pu punch your number into the chat or uh, put your question in the chat box on the right. Or if you want to just ask me, that's okay too. I want to. Let me share my screen. Any questions? Okay. Oh, nice job, Pete. Thank you, John. Question, uh, let's see. How often, how often have you seen people swap technologies when one is not working well? Well, that's not super uncommon. Uh, we've put in ultrasonic uh, transit time and it didn't work and we ended up going with Doppler. Um, 
and uh, trying to think what else. Um, that's the only thing that comes to mind, but yeah, that's why you really should do it. If it's a questionable application, I would definitely suggest doing some type of a pilot. From a reliability standpoint, the ones that have no moving parts are best. The, the turbine meters are more for potable water. Uh, turbine meters can have issues as well. Um, the bearings can go on them and they go out of calibration. Most of these meters we can calibrate in the field. A turbine meter is hard to do in the field. You got to kind of yank it out and send it back to the, the manufacturer for calibration. Well, if you guys have any questions down the road, don't hesitate to send me an email. Oh, here's a question. Pennsylvania may be introducing a bill such that, that went away on me. Pennsylvania may be introducing a bill such that water companies can't bill for lost water that doesn't reach its destination. Any thoughts that technologies would be most, what technology be, would be most likely be used for inexpensively but accurately measuring potable water to determine water loss? Um, one of the things I know that they do up in Scranton is they measure the, the depth in their tanks. So you've got so much water coming into the tank you got so much water coming out, I say tank reservoirs, you can compare the reservoir levels over time based upon flow readings and putting in temporary flow meters like ultrasonics in different locations in your distribution system could be a solution to that as well. Uh, it's really understanding and identifying where you might be losing the water by putting flow meters, strategically placing them where you can do some determination. Thank you, Shane. Uh, okay, well, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for coming. Uh, look forward to doing the next one. Uh, we'll let you know for sure, and hopefully we'll have this COVID behind us and we can do them live here. In the meantime, if you have any questions, give me a call, call Neil Systems. We've got a bunch of people that have, know a lot about this stuff that can help you. Take care.